welcome to Cracking the Cryptic. So something a bit different today. I'm just going to have a have a bit of a ramble, a bit of a think about the differences between American and British crossword puzzles. Um, uh, starting with uh, this book by John Halpin, which was uh, released six years ago to mark the centenary of the crossword, which is its title. Um, the crossword was invented in 1913, so there are a certain amount of uh, publications in 2013 to recognise that. Now, this book by John Halpin, very good book. Um, I, quite, I enjoyed it a lot. It had amongst a number of prefaces, one by Will Shorts, who is um, the most famous person, not in British puzzles, which the book was more about, but in American puzzles. Now, Will Shorts is the editor of the New York Times crossword. He took over some 30 years ago from a guy called Eugene Maleska. Under Mr. Maleska, I think the New York Times had become a little bit, what's the word, rarefied maybe. The, the answers in it were dictionary answers to a huge extent um, or slightly obscure general knowledge, always with very standard definition clues. And um, frankly, for, for a lot of people, it had become quite dull. Now, some of the older people who got used to that sort of puzzle obviously enjoyed it. That was what they did every day. They, that was what to them what a crossword puzzle was. What Will did, as I understand it, was to, first of all, introduce some um, gradations of easiness and difficulty, including making Monday easier, the easiest puzzle of the week, and then the puzzle gets harder during the week until Friday and Saturday is the hardest, and then Sunday's a bigger one. Um, Friday and Saturday became puzzles with no themes so that compilers could choose interesting vocabulary. Um, but the particular aspect that I think will achieve that hadn't been done before was to introduce um, entries that were very much more in the language than before. Now, the, the shape of an American crossword puzzle, which is fully checked, every answer every letter is in two answers, means that you have to have a certain amount of fill. You have to have a number of words, particularly vowel-heavy entries that fit in places. Um, and that had meant that there were a few standard words that appeared again and again in the puzzle. I presume things like allo and omu, one of... Um, Joseph Conrad's least known books, I think, and no, oh no, Herman Melville, and um, other little bizarre things that that solvers had to get to know, had to get used to. Now that's still the case a little because of the shapes of these grids, but by introducing slang terms and um, partials and more modern phrases, that's been able to be varied considerably, and I think. Most solvers agree that's to the benefit of the puzzle. Probably not all, but almost all. And what that's given the New York Times puzzle and American crossword puzzles subsequently in general, it's a much younger audience, people who are hearing phrases that are, as it, as it might be said, in the language that, that they hear a lot. Um, I spoke with Will once about the words done and done, or the phrase done and done, which was an answer in one of the puzzles. And I said, it's, it's interesting how it's a lively phrase, but it couldn't appear in a British puzzle. Um, I'll come to why in a moment. And Will said he didn't think there was a single American solver who wouldn't enjoy the, the phrase done and done as an interesting phrase that, that should appear in a puzzle. Now, British puzzles followed a slightly different path. Because they didn't go with the unchecked grid, they went more with something like this. There was a lot more variety um, in the sorts of words that could be put in puzzles. Now, there a little bit of crossword ease developed, like a word like a carpy would often be very useful to fill a gap with an O, an A, and an I. So crossword lovers got to know some crossword ease, but not as much as an American crossword lover. Um, that, the, the fact that the puzzles are much more open meant that you could fit a lot more things in. But British puzzles stayed very rigorously with words in the dictionary. Um, now, the reason I mentioned this 
preface by Will Shorts in the Centenary of the Crossword is he wrote a very interesting essay here in which he said he noted the divergence of English and uh, or British and American puzzles for exactly the reasons that we were talking about with the shapes of the grid. British puzzles d developed cryptic clues and American puzzles were definition only. And Will noted that maybe 30 years ago the um, puzzles started coming together a bit more in terms particularly of the sorts of clue that would appear. So on the difficult days or in other difficult puzzles, um, in American puzzles, the clues would suddenly be a lot more either vague or misleading. Um, and very similar sometimes to British, at least the British cryptic definition clues. So for the answer Leo, in a tough American puzzle or a, or a more difficult one, you might see the clue summer house, question mark, because it, house can mean a sign of the zodiac and Leo appears in summer. And that exact same clue has appeared in British puzzles as well when the answer Leo has, has been needed. So there have been some similarities developing. However, what I'd like to observe is that in another way, in this choice of vocabulary that I've been talking about, the puzzles have diverged dramatically in the last 30 years. So now the reaction to British puzzles, as I say, in, in British puzzles you very much get dictionary words. If a word hasn't reached the dictionary, it's generally accepted that you can't use it in a British puzzle. Now some proper names will be exceptions to that. But a phrase that maybe people use but isn't in the dictionary doesn't get into British puzzles most of the time. And that's very different. Um, we've had some American solvers of the magpie who have been really baffled by this. And even by the tradition, once, once British puzzles get harder or they're using barred grids instead of blocked grids, sometimes the needs for fill and to fit themes in mean that words go to the back to the difficult words in the dictionary, the words that come from Shakespeare or Spencer, words nobody knows but are in the dictionary and justifiable. And as I say, American solvers have not been excited by that. That's kind of nonsense to them, filling the puzzle with, with rubbish. Whereas British solvers are much more likely to complain when the puzzles are filled with newer words, like if back in the day appears, somebody's going to complain that that's just not a real phrase, even though people use it now. So the expectation has changed dramatically. Um, one, of the, one of the most inveterate complainers um, in the US, I think, is um, Rex Parker, who writes a blog on the New York Times every day, and he is particularly hard on um, dictionary words. This was a review from some years ago where he found the, the puzzle painful to solve because of the staleness of the vocabulary, complained about words like nice and at man, um, and especially leveret. He really didn't like that. Now, leveret, you probably know, or you may know, is the young of a hare. Interestingly, when that appears in a British puzzle, people quite like it. That's general knowledge that they feel they should know or they need to be introduced to. There was a clue who recently continually blocking grant to youngster in form. And to understand the definition youngster in form for leveret, you had to both know that a leveret was the young of a hare and that a form is the warren of a hare or the burrow of a hare. So that's... You know, to an American, presumably, that would be really obscure if they might not know leveret at all as a word. Um, and Rex is always complaining about older words like this, words that are in the dictionary but nobody uses. And to a British solver, that would be an astonishing complaint. In fact, in on the Times forum, there's, there's a guy who always complains if slang appears in the Times crossword. He thinks it's the job of the, uh, of the compiler to keep out vernacular. And there's another one who solves the, the concise crossword in the Times, the definition-only crossword, who every time there's an uh, Americanism used complains that it should be the job of the compiler to keep out American words from the British puzzle, which is an astonishing um, degree of animosity, in my view. Now, there are... 
There are areas in which complaints about the words that can be used in puzzles get fairly similar. And two down in this recent New York Times puzzle was a very interesting entry. The, the answer was Bena, B-E-A-N-E-R. Um, and the complaint was, the, the clue was about a baseball thrown over head, which is normally called a bean ball, but apparently there is a dictionary definition of that as Bena. However, there is also a phrase, uh, or Bina is in use sometimes by some parts of the USA as a slur about Mexicans, possibly because they eat beans, I don't know. I've never heard it myself, and that doesn't mean one thing one way or the other, but clearly it is in use by um, some, some Americans about Mexicans, and it's clearly derogatory. So... Why should it be allowed in the puzzle? Or why shouldn't it be allowed in the puzzle? Now, Will's defense was that, firstly, he'd never heard the slur. Secondly, even though it was brought to his attention for publication, um, his feeling, rightly or wrongly, is that any benign meaning of a word is fair game for a crossword. And I think that's certainly something that applies in Britain. Um, you can use a word in a puzzle like chink or nip um, because it has a genuine meaning. As long as you're defining it not by the pejorative or the slang term, um, it's perfectly acceptable. And that, I think, is something that will continue, certainly in British crosswords, for a long way. But there's a lot of pressure building up in America for words like that just to never appear. Will actually defended um, this with, he mentioned that there is an entry that appears sometimes, go okay, which fra phrase entries are allowed in American puzzles. We include that last April as proceed all right, it says here, to go okay. But obviously if you read it as one word, it's gook, and that's only a vulgar word about an Asian. So um, those are really quite serious territories and the puzzle Rex's point is why would you ever publish a puzzle that had a word in it that could offend someone but I think that's a very strong point Rex has waged a, a huge war against the word lame appearing in the puzzle recently because a lot of disabled people are offended by it now that may be true but lame has a lot of meanings that have nothing to do with disability. You know, you can be temporarily lame and limping, and I don't think that's the same as being disabled. You, An excuse can be lame. Does he want to ban lame, the fabric, which is spelt the same from the puzzle? Does he want to not have the word blame appearing because it's got lame in it? You know, I think these are issues that, that we do need to think about. I think Will's standpoint is very clear, that if there is a benign meaning of a word, which is most meanings of most words, and if you clue it that way, then you're not slurring anybody. And solvers should focus on the genuine meaning of the word, rather than seeking to ban loads and loads of words from puzzles. That not only restricts compilers in what they can do, but also just seems to me to be giving a lot of vocabulary to the dark side and only leaving other vocabulary for the, for the pure of heart. And I think it's going too far. We do have the same issue, as I say, in British puzzles, but nobody has suggested that lame shouldn't appear yet. You do have to be a little careful, perhaps, with a word like paddy, because it would be slightly derogatory if you include it as an Irishman, but it can mean a rage or a field of rice. So those sorts of words do appear. Um, and it's just a general thought that I think maybe we ought to be a little bit more accepting of words in crosswords, not just because it makes compilers' lives easy to be able to fit them in, but because language develops and changes Language used in puzzles might not be now, it might be from the past, and that's fine for some people. That's the language that they may have grown up with, and I don't think they should be excluded from puzzles just because young people don't use the phrases they used. Rex fascinatingly also complains if 
um, technological words that are a few years out of date appear because that's just not current. And again, why must compilers be so constrained? That's, I'm calling for a bit more tolerance in the use of words in puzzles. I accept Will's definition of, of what is acceptable in a puzzle. I, I'm not an apologist for him. I suspect he's going to have to move position on this soon and start um, <clears throat> keeping words out that might offend people. In fact, in this particular case, it was pointed out before, and there were a number of very simple fixes to get rid of Bina. Um, and I think maybe I'd have done that, I have to say. But I totally understand this viewpoint. It certainly applies to most British puzzles. And it's just an interesting area for debate. I'd be very interested in your thoughts in, in the comments on this area. Um, and obviously, we'll all keep a watch on how crosswords develop in the future. Thanks very much for watching. I hope that was a bit more interesting than, than if you're not so interested in the fine detail of solving individual clues. Um, but we'll be back on that subject at some point soon. Good to see you and I uh, hope to see you again on Cracking Cryptic. Bye for now.